church. Good morning. And a happy Easter to all of you here. I'm so glad. My heart is so full to see so many of you here this morning on this glorious day. We've come here. Excuse me. <clears throat> We come here to pray, to sing, to lament, to give glory to God on this glorious, glorious Easter Sunday morning. I also want to lift up that today is also Trans Visibility Day in the UCC Church. So I also want to recognize that and honor that in ways that you see fit. For any visitors among us, please know that we have parking um, in the in the closest lots and we will be charged a dollar for that. We will stamp your uh, car for you. So please see, see one of us before you exit the sanctuary today. I believe John has an announcement. Good morning and happy Easter. I want to have you help us welcome Chris McCloskey to our keyboard, to our organ today. Uh, I first met Chris in the boiler room of our church when he was working uh, on re-leathering our bellows uh, on, the, on, on the organ. So it's good to have him up in this beautiful space on this day. So thank you and welcome Chris. to worship, print it in your bulletin. Please rise if able. Yesterday we thought death had won. Yesterday we thought all was lost. Yesterday we thought that Christ was gone. But not today. Today we know that love has won. Today we know that hope is real. Today we know that Christ is here. We have reason to sing, Alleluia, Alleluia. Amen. Our first hymn is hymn 233, Jesus Christ has risen today.
the, woman, the women come to the tomb, and to their surprise, instead of finding Jesus, they find angels. And the angels tell the women, Jesus is not here. That answer is better than confusion. But the angels say, remember what he told you. Remember. It's one of those words that Jesus used at the Last Supper. And it's one of the first words we hear at the empty tomb. Remember. I, I think this call to remember is why we need the prayer of confession and these words of forgiveness every single week. It isn't enough to hear of God's grace just one time. We need to hear it over and over and over again, week after week. We need to be reminded that God's grace and mercy will never run out. So friends, let us run to God like the women ran to the tomb. Let us tell the truth of our lives so that once again we can be reminded that our God is a God of grace, mercy, and love. So let's pray so we can remember. Please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. The stone, the stone is rolled away. away. We, we assume it's a mistake. The angels say, he is, he is not here. here. We, we assume their news is fake. The, the women tell the story, but we, we do not want, want to hear it. it. Peter runs to the tomb, but we, we do not understand it. Forgive us, God, for thinking, for thinking the empty tomb is nothing more than a prank. Forgive us for seeing the discarded burial cloths and still holding tight to death. Forgive us for pushing away reasons to hope when you are alive and well in the world. Teach us to see what you see. Unravel the threads of our unbelief. The angels tell the women, remember what Jesus told you. So church, remember this. You are seen, you are forgiven, you are held in God's grace. All this is true. Grace and mercy abound for you. Remember this. Amen. It is now time for the passing of the peace, and Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by one cross. We meet his name when we share his peace. May the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And now I invite you to share a sign of Christ's undying love. Good morning, man. <laughs> I have a story for the children. Or the child who lives within your heart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul, for so much. I appreciate it. Yes, come on, come on, Jim. Yes, yes.
They didn't like the way that he was teaching folks to love. They had Jesus killed. That's the hard part of the story. But when we tell this story, it's important to remember that this is a God story. This is a love story, so God always has the final say. And God can make happy endings because just like Jesus, God is love. So the hard part of the story is Jesus' enemies did a very bad thing. They killed him on the cross. After Jesus was killed, his friends and family were very, very sad and, well, their heart was broken. They put Jesus into a tomb and put a big stone in front of him. Now I imagine Jesus and his friends were took some time to be sad and hug each other and try to fix their broken hearts. They went to the spot where Jesus was buried and when they got there they noticed that the stone was rolled away and Jesus was not there. But how can this be? Remember that Jesus has the final say. Jesus can mend a broken heart. This, my friends, is Easter. It is the ultimate happy ending. And it's a love story. This God story is really a love story. But not a love story about princes and princesses. It's a love story about God and Jesus. It's about you and me. This story changes across from a sad thing to a good thing. It reminds us that no matter what happens, God is with us. And this makes us brave enough to love ourselves and love each other. This makes us brave enough to mend, to mend those broken hearts, but also the hearts of our family and friends and even some people we don't know. So while Easter is about chocolate and bunnies and dyed eggs and ham, it's also about new life. It's about forgiveness. It's about finding your happy ending. And you recall one thing from this weird meditation. <laughs> Remember that love conquers all. And that love heals broken hearts. This is Easter. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for always being with us. Help us to love you, love ourselves, and love everyone else. Amen. Um.
Greetings. On that first Easter morning, the disciples struggled to hear the good news. Doubt clouded their minds. Negativity took root and hope vanished with a simple shake of their heads. As we return to this familiar text, help us to hear differently this morning. Open our ears that we might hear the sound of alleluias ringing through this text. Open up our minds that this mystery and joy of Easter might feel within reach. Open up our hearts that we might believe the unbelievable. And like Peter, in this hearing, may we move closer to you, God of the empty tomb. We are hungry for your good news. Speak to us now with the hope in our hearts as we listen and we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on that first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all of this to the eleven, and to all of the rest. Now it was Mary and Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told this to the apostles. But these words did not seem an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up, and he ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. And then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Will you pray with me? Oh, Holy One, we thank you for this day, this gathering, this moment. To honor in your word, to understand your story. Both human and divine. Full of love, mercy, and grace. Let us dive deeper into this Easter story. Let us know what you know. And gather us as we, our families are spread all around this country, this world. We ask you to gather us back together in your heart. And may this story take root in us and may we spread it to everyone that we know. We ask these things in Christ's holy name. Well, friends, this Easter story starts off with more questions and confusion, but ends with awe and wonder and hope. It is the beginning of something new. But the disciples did not know that yet. So the women went out early in the morning with their spices to prepare the body of Christ, which was their custom. Even after death, Yes, the women are still the nurturers and the caregivers. Imagine the scene, imagine the emotions, the, the heartache, the, the anger, the fear, the intimacy, the closeness to lovingly and tenderly make ready the body of their beloved Jesus. But when they arrived, they did not encounter what they expected. See, the stone was rolled away. Why is the stone rolled away? Where is Jesus and who are these men? Two mysterious figures in gleaming white clothing holds yet another question. They ask the women, why do you seek the living among the dead? Why do you seek the living among the dead? But this is something that we do. We are used to our customs and traditions. We do the same thing, expecting the same results. They didn't know the world was about to turn, even though Jesus told them. But there by that tomb, they did not remember or understand. Because sometimes we are more comfortable accepting what is probable instead of what is possible. I mean, it makes sense. They watched Jesus die. The woman followed Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem. They watched as his body was taken down from the cross. They watched as Joseph of Arimathea took the body, wrapped it in linen, and placed it in the tomb, cued from a rock where no other body had previously been laid. Then they went home to prepare their spices to complete the proper barrier of service, which was their custom. They watched Jesus die, they watched him be taken down, wrapped and put it and placed in the tomb. So the next logical thing was for their spices, a task that fell to the women. See, all this is reasonable and rational, and, but except we're talking about Jesus here, so reasonable and rational don't always work. Because Jesus is not dealing with probable, Jesus deals in what is possible. Jesus deals in hope. As Emily Dickinson wrote in her famous poem, hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without words and never stops at all. Hope is a thing with feathers. Maybe that's what Jesus is like. Perhaps that's what Maya Angelou was trying to tell us in her poem, Still I Rise. Just like the moon and the suns with the certainty of the tide, just like hope springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. I'll rise. 
And why do we seek the living among the dead when Jesus did rise like moons and suns, like the certainty of the tide, Jesus did rise. But they wanted to see him broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, but like air, Jesus did rise. Because with Jesus, the improbable is possible. In fact, there's a certainty because Jesus conquered death. Hope is not a foolish thing. It is foundational to our faith. I know how the world seems. So do you, but hope has wings. I know there is injustice and outright lies, but just like on that third day, hope is still going to rise. And there are some people who believe that this Easter story of rising and flying is uniquely an American story. But on this Easter Sunday, the Spirit compels me to speak against Christian nationalism speak against Christian consumerism, to speak against those who would take our holy scriptures and turn them into blasphemy. Now, I don't use that word lightly or often, but in this time, it seems to fit. Those who seek to isolate and segregate and manipulate, those who turn our story of hope and goodness and optimism into a story of patriotism and pessimism do not understand what happened on that cross Amen. or what happened at that tomb. They are not ready for the world to change. They are looking for the living among the dead. They are holding on to the old way, the broken way, the living is not among the dead. They're holding on to the old way, the broken way, the sexist way, dare I say, the xenophobic way, dare I say, the racist way, the homophobic way. But there is only one way, and that way is Jesus. That, that way is love, that way is sacrifice, that way is paying the ultimate price. That's why on this Easter morning, the Spirit compels me to remind us that Jesus was a, Jesus was a poor Palestinian Jew born to an unwed mother who was killed by empire but raised for us all. For everything that has breath, Jesus took his last. For everything that bleeds, Jesus gave his blood. For everything that has a heart, Jesus gave every beat. This was the start of something new, something universal, something cosmopolitan, something egalitarian. We are going to have to get comfortable with what is possible instead of what is custom and probable and easy and predictable. We are going to have to get comfortable with Jesus, not as a character in a book, but as the Savior, the Messiah, the Messiah, the anointed, the Christ. So my question for all of us in this sanctuary today is how are we going to bring Christ back to life in our own communities, in our own lives? Not falling back to the old ways of tyranny and empire. Not by seeking the living among the dead, but remembering what Jesus said. The words they remembered. They had to reorient themselves to new possibilities, to new realities. From a world with a fleshy God to a world with a living God. From a world with a fleshy God to a world with a living God. How can we do the same? Three times Jesus foretold his death. Three times he said, I must suffer these things. Three times he said, I must be killed. Three times he said on the third day I will be raised to life. And three times they failed to understand that hope has wings. Three times they failed to understand that there is a dawning of a new way that will rise with the certainty of the tides. Three times they failed to see that Jesus is going to change everything. Everything. But the promise of new life is never straightforward, is it? 
We don't always recognize liberation when it is announced to us or believe when we hear the good news because we're so accustomed to loss. We are accustomed to death. We're accustomed to, we fall back into our old custom of bringing spices and looking for the living among the dead. But we, because we've seen the sheer power and spite of empire strike down those we love and those we believe in, and sometimes that trauma and struggle, it wounds us so deeply, it makes it so hard to believe in something new. Sometimes what obscures through life is our certainty of what salvation is supposed to look like. See, Jesus' followers struggle to, to, to fathom this new world that will spring from an empty tomb. So we can make sense of Palm Sunday and Monday Thursday. We can make sense of miracles. We can even make sense of Jesus' violent death at the hands of empire. After all, we've seen that so many times before. But life, new life after the tomb, well, that just seems unfathomable. New life feels unbelievable, unfathomable. New life feels impossible, but siblings, the rock is rolled away. That means anything is possible. It is an inkling of salvation. It is an intimation of what is to come. It is about hope rising and things with wings. <clears throat> Jesus reveals that salvation was never a place, but a way. In him, we will never be without God, and God will never be without us. We are entwined, all of us, pushing and pulling and tumbling through life together. And that kingdom of God is right here. The kingdom of God is right here. We are living it, breathing it every day. It is being knit into us with every step of Christ's life, in every conversation, in every meal, in every miracle, in every healing, in every foot he took with his hands to wash. In these small acts, he gathered the pieces of all of our lives and stitched them to his own and breathed his love, his communion, his song into us. The resurrection was the revelation that all Jesus had been doing all along was giving our life back to us, this roll back rock life, a transformed life where anything is possible. Could this really be true? The truth is change is hard. The disciples struggled to believe the women just like today, folks struggle to believe women. In this text, the disciples don't just not believe them. It's a downright dismissal. Some translations will render the reaction as an idle tale or foolish talk or nonsense, but the Greek word is garbage. It's garbage. Hear this. Despite no matter how many times Christ told them, the disciples called the women's truth garbage. The woman announced that Jesus' promises were fulfilled and from the ones closest to Jesus, even they did not believe. <coughs> not listening to others and devaluing others, that is the old way. We must align ourselves with the new way in Jesus, the way of hope, the way of love. What are we going to do with this roll back life? What are we going to do with this empty tomb? What does it mean to us today in these pews, in this sanctuary? Because some of us are stuck in these old ways, old customs, and that's okay because we're in good company. But right now on this Easter morning, we have a chance to be like Peter and run to that tomb. Even after betrayal and doubt and confusion, we can still run right to that tomb. We can run head first into mystery, into awe, into wonder. I said we're some of us are in good company because, you know, Peter never had all the answers and he is the rock of the church. And he ran to that too with his heart guiding him, looking for a hope rising and things with wings. 
My friends, we don't have all the answers either, but that's okay. We just have to be open and curious and kind. We have to be willing to lead with our hearts, not just our heads. Because in the matters of the heart, one can never calculate hope and faith just using our head. This is a matter of the heart. One can never quantify sacrificial love. Remember, we are the people of the road back life. We are children of the resurrection. We are living in our salvation. It's not out there. It's in here. Jesus has knit himself and it's into our hearts, into every prayer, into every song, into every healing, into every single Easter morning. Hope is a thing with wings. It cannot be killed. And just like Jesus, hope will always rise. Empire is an Easter. Jesus is. Amen. I now invite you to rise and able for our affirmation of faith printed in your bulletin. We may weep through the longest nights. We, we may, may stare at the empty tomb with more questions than answers. We, we may run our fingers over the burial walls, still long for more. But today, today we are a people of hope. We, we believe in new beginnings. We believe that the God who created the world is stronger than the death. We believe that Jesus abides among us, healing, teaching, and leaving fingerprints throughout this world. We believe that the tomb cannot hold him. We believe that the sun does rise. We believe that Peter was there with questions, awe, and faith decides to come to sleep. We believe that the story is not over yet. For God is among us. Today we are a people of hope. Amen. Please be seated. When the women got to the tomb on that Easter morning, they were met by angels who told them, He's not here, but remember what he told you. I can't help but wonder, there in that garden, as the sun rolls over the trees, if they remember it all. I wonder if they remember it telling 5,000 people to sit in the grass, passing out baskets of fish and bread. I wonder if they remembered how he stopped in the middle of the crowd to ask, who touched my robe? I wonder if they remembered how he ate with Zacharias or scooped up the children onto his knee. I wonder if they remembered him teaching in the temple telling people, love your neighbor as yourself. I wonder if you remember how the wind stopped with just the sound of his voice. I wonder if they remembered how he washed their feet and said, this is my body broken for you. I wonder if they remembered it all. Friends, just like the women in the garden, we need those same reminders. The suffering of the world can erode the muscle memory of grace and welcome that we hold, but don't let it. Come to the table and remember. Remember how Jesus fed everyone. Remember how none, none were turned away. Remember how he said, do this in remembrance of me. Come and remember. There is room for you here. Let us pray. God of today and tomorrow, God of the garden and the tomb, God of our faith and our doubt, we are running towards you. Like Peter on that Easter morning, we simply cannot stay away with our beating hearts and wide eyes. We have arrived in this sanctuary, bringing with us our questions, our hopes, our joys, our concerns. Hear all these prayers as we draw closer to you. God of our dawn, we start with our hopes. Join with me in saying, thank you for the gifts of this world that instill buoyancy in us. Thank you for the curiosity of children, for the 
the sound of people singing in unison, for crowd out tables in the neighborly times, with the sun after the rain, the spring after the frost, love after loss, and faith after death. Like Peter, the countless reasons is full of hope. Highest among them is the joy and promise of this day. Thank you for these holy breadcrumbs on the journey of faith. However, before we found ourselves in the garden, before the joy and hallelujahs of this day, we found ourselves at the foot of the cross. So for the things that erode our hope, for the things that stitch doubt and fear into our hearts, we ask for your comforting hand. Lord, wrap your arms around those who are still locked in the upper room. Wrap your arms around those who cannot find healing after the longest night. Wrap your arms around all those with reasons to hope, who cannot find those breadcrumbs amongst reasons to grieve. Holy God, like Peter, fan the flame of our faith. Like Peter, invite us to step out of our boats. And like Peter, use us to care for those in need to tell your story and build a better world. We remember, we believe, so awestruck, wildly beating, grateful hearts. We run toward you. With our feet in the garden and our eyes on the cross, we pray to you, saying the words that, that, that your son taught his, his disciples say, Our God, who art in heaven, heaven. I'll I'll come up in thy name, thy kingdom come, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, and the glory, and the glory, and the glory. And all that night, Jesus took the cup, poured out for his friends, and said, This is the cup of the new cup poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And also he took the bread and broke it and said, each time you eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, the table is set, all is made ready. Come, there is room at this table.
Let us now pray together the prayer after communion printed in your bulletin. We thank you, Lord God, for your life, your life pulsing in creation, revealed of Jesus, renewed in resurrection, and available to us now. We thank you for touching us again with your life, your bread and wine, for joining our lives with yours through Jesus, and for the renewed resurrection in our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Steadfast love is not a love that simply waits for us to stop wandering and return home. God's love comes seeking after us and gives us the gift of Jesus. So we might live a life abundant. Our giving this morning, whether it be lost and wandering or safe and secure, expresses our firm conviction that God is with us no matter what. Let us gather our gifts and offer them in gratitude heartfelt com commitment and praise. Turn to your bulletin and together we will be 
with the operatory gravity. Optimal oh, God, God, we come with our offerings in response to your love. With the new life in Christ, we give ourselves in service to others. With the energy bestowed by the Spirit, we seek to inflame all your people with a zeal for your way. Receive the work we do and the gifts we bring, that they may become a blessing in your sight.
trusting in that good news. Amen. Now friends, before we leave the sanctuary, I brought the tradition for me that came from another church I served in, and I call it the Alleluia Course. So you are now invited to come forward and sing Alleluia. Um, hopefully, Jeff will lead us. <laughs> Jeff's going to lead us. It's going to be great. Um, all voices are beautiful in God's eyes, so we invite you to sing with us. Come on, come on, come on. Come on down. I'm a terrible singer, but I'm coming. So am I. <laughs>